Hello, my name is John Marshall. Welcome to the very first in this series of Textiles of Japan. Um, this is part of our Textile of the Month Club, which will be appearing on YouTube once a month. There's no charge for this. You're welcome to watch it. For those of you interested in the samples that will be presented, I do have a subscription available in which the samples are sent out to you on a monthly basis to go along with the um, talks that I'll be giving each month. And as a member of the Textile of the Month Club, you'll be invited to participate in Zoom recordings of these sessions as I prepare them on a monthly basis to follow along with the samples you've received in the mail. And you'll have that opportunity to ask questions about what I've presented. So um, each video clip that will be appearing is about 30 minutes or so long, and that'll be followed by 30 minutes or so of questions, which of course is available just to those with the textile subscription. So I'd encourage you to go ahead and check out the link below. You'll see all of the details for subscribing and all of your options, and I hope you'll enjoy us. But with or without that textile subscription, you're more than welcome to follow along as I cover each topic each month, and I hope that you enjoy and get something out of what I'll be presenting to you. So let's go ahead and get started on, on our very first one, which is bingata, and the sample included is a very specific type of bingata called oboro bingata. Okay, let's get started. Bingata with John Marshall. Textile of the Month Club, our sample number one, Oboro Bingata. Uh, this is a beautifully dyed piece. It is Okinawan dyed by Okinawans in Okinawa. The label that came with the bolt of fabric says Ryukyu Bingata, which means Okinawan Bingata. And here you can see it's very representative of the Oboro Bingata style, which has all of this beautiful range of colors presented. So let's talk about the dyes and the sequence in which they're applied, first of all, which makes it uh, typically Okinawan. So of course, we'll be starting with a stencil. Um, this is a typical Okinawan style stencil carved out of handmade mulberry paper. The stencil is used to apply rice paste to the textile, which helps to define the imagery as the colors are being hand painted, um, a little bit along the line of the wax in batik. The very first colors added are normally the most eye-catching. Now, they're not necessarily the brightest. It could be a dark black, but, but the most eye-catching. And so those colors, as you'll see represented on the right hand each side, are the colors isolated as I'm applying them. Now, what you want to attempt to do is to have each of these individual colors balanced in and of itself. If all the yellows are balanced, then when you combine it with the purples and the reds, the overall piece is guaranteed to be balanced. And so that's a little trick that the Okinawans use to get these beautiful repeating patterns without having anything seem too heavy on one side or the other. So you go along again from the most eye-catching, from the vermilion to the red to the yellow, purple, blue, and so forth. And eventually, you start to run out of places to apply color. And for that very reason, you want to keep the dullest colors, the least eye-catching colors, saved for the last. Because if they wind up being not quite balanced, it's not going to really register or cause any sort of a, or jarring interruption in the syncopation of the entire design. And so here you see my last color planned is this soft gray neutral color that just fades into the background. But, you know, as it happens, there were three spots that somehow didn't get any color applied and I need to fill them. And the gray's already there, so I don't want to put that. So that gave me an opportunity to go ahead in a balanced manner to add just a little bit more spark to my piece. Now, once all of the basic colors are applied, there's another step called kumadori. These are very similar, and the word is the same, for the markings that are put on the faces of kabuki actors. A kabuki actor starts with a blank face, just the white makeup. It's the kumadori that tells you who the character is and gives that character personality. So that's what we're going to do to our dyed piece. Now on the left you see all of our basic colors that were applied. So next I'm going to go in with a very deep red or a dark indigo and start doing shading. These are the most common things used currently for kumadori, but it can be any color. It can be a green or anything else. Once you have all of your kumadori done, the piece is cured, which sometimes takes quite a while. You go ahead and wash off that paste with water, um, bathtub, river, ocean, wherever you have handy to wash it. It's nothing toxic in it. And then you're ready 
for the next stage. The next stage is applying these soft tints. Now they do serve a purpose. If there is a little bit of cracking in your paste or you got off a little bit, these soft tints can help to lessen the contrast and distract you from what is actually a problem. Um, but they also add pattern and they also add a gentler, softer edge to many of the harsher colors that may have been applied. Once you have that done, you're all set for framing and you have your beautiful artwork. Let's talk about the stencils for just a moment then that are used to create these pieces. There are three basic styles that you saw here. Normally, all of them are included in some manner or other with any given stencil. To carve a stencil, the Okinawans traditionally use a hardened type of tohu instead of a plastic cutting mat. Now that might seem a little bit odd, but the tofu has a lot of give to it. It doesn't dull the blade. And as the mat is damaged, as your tofu block is damaged, you simply slice off that layer and you have a brand new section ready to go. Then another integral ingredient is the rice paste resist. Sometimes color is added to it to make it easier to see on the cloth. And that paste is applied with a range of spatulas. Um, they come in all different shapes and sizes depending on the preference of the dyeing artist, the person applying the paste. To apply the paste, it's first pushed onto the fabric. If it's a repeating pattern, that stencil is picked up and moved down, more paste is pushed through, and on and on until your bolt is filled. There is another way not using stencils in which you use a cone and this is called tsutsugaki, and it's very much a part of uh, bingata. And you do it very much like drawing happy birthday on a cake. Now, in desperate times, like right after the war when these supplies weren't available, you may do with what you had. In this case, as you see with the sample here, <laughs> you know, the desperate but also very ingenious local citizens went around and collected the shell casings from all of the bullets that were left over from the island having been uh, bombarded as it was. Now, that cone is used to draw your design freehand, but it's also used to block out already dyed areas. And those dyed, those blocked out areas will protect the color as you go ahead, and in this case, dye the background. That's what gives us our oboro bingata in the colored backgrounds you saw earlier. Now to make all of this easier, there's very traditional equipment called harite and shinshi, okay? It gives you a nice, taut, trampoline-like surface upon which to work. This is an image of a, a production studio in Okinawa. They have a very ingenious method of rolling the fabric up an entire bolt up through these tumblers. Now, there are still harite and shinshi attached to the fabric, but this allows the dyer to sit and work in comfort as color after color is applied. Now, of course, more smaller studios, artisans are not going to have this kind of a setup. Soy milk is used to help bind the colors to the cloth, and it's also used as a sizing and a finish. To apply the soy milk, a jizome bake is used, but other brushes are also used for the individual spots of color, such as the surikomi bake or the bokashi fude. Okinawan brushes traditionally were made from human hair. Uh, this is an example of the bokashi bake. Unfortunately, in modern times, people's diets have changed and that affects the quality of the hair, especially if they're dyeing it or so forth. They're dyeing their hair, bleaching their hair. Then that makes it no longer quite the right material for the brushes that are required. So nowadays, most people actually use deer hair for their brushes. Let's move on to the colors for just a minute. Plants, minerals, insects, there are many, many different sources. Plants and insects are used to produce dyes and lakes. Minerals are also used in commonly called pigments. Okay, now you see the protein, the, the soybeans are used, cochineal as an insect is used, indigo is used, um, things such as cochineal, which is an insect, can be turned into a lake, which is a pigment and applied with soy milk. There are other juice dyes, plant dyes, um, such as fukugi, which gives us the bright yellow in the back of some of the Okinawan kimonos. And then of course, with that is often a mordant, which helps to set the dye. And of course, the fiber, the yardage upon which we're doing our dyeing is a crucial part of our story here. The Okinawans commonly use silk coming from China. Later, cotton was introduced. They also used a variety of cellulose-based fibers, such as reimi, or bashofu, which is a type of banana, and of course the ever popular cannabis. This is a shot 
of a kimono that my teacher dyed in 1958. It uses all of the traditional Okinawan bingate elements. It has all of the bright colors, traditional dyes, and so forth, and a traditional layout, although dyed in the shape of a Japanese-style kimono, not an Okinawan one. Let's take a look at the dyes that she used. Cinnabar, which is a mineral, you may be more familiar with it in the form of Chinese cinnabar jewelry and beads. And then there's malachite, which gives us the wonderful rich greens. There's azurite with the deep ocean blues. And then there are non-mineral colors as well, such as cochineal, which is an insect used for the bright reds. And of course, lac is also an insect used to give reds. Then we have indigo, which is a plant. The Okinawan indigo, Strobilanthus kusia, gives us the same indigo as that produced in India, but the plants used are totally unrelated. And then finally, here's an example of orpiment, which gives us the nice, rich lemon yellows. Take a moment to look at the chart in the lower left-hand corner, illustrating the broad range of pigments found all over the world and then glance at the Okinawan map. You can see how very blessed Okinawan has been with this abundant range of colors. So it, it's only natural that they would tap into that for their textiles. And in addition, mineral dyes being rocks, basically, don't fade. And that's an important consideration in the bright, hot, intense tropical sun that we find in Okinawa. So what's the difference between pigments and dyes? Well, there's a decided difference in how you use them. Pigments may be minerals or lakes. Lakes are pigment extracted from different sources, such as cochineal or indigo. And one of the chief characteristics of pigments is that they sit on the surface of the fiber. They may penetrate slightly, but not very much. Now, when it comes to the other types of dyes, those do penetrate deep into the fiber, and they're also subject to fading more than the pigments are. The natural dyes also often require a mordant to help them bind to the fiber. Now, many of these things can be either a dye or a pigment, depending on how they're processed. These are some of the commonly used mordants throughout Okinawa and Japan. These minerals don't necessarily need to be mined. You might have them sitting in your own backyard. Here I'm visiting my neighbor to help her clean her ozone filter for her well water, and I'm saving aside all of the manganese to use as a pigment in my dye work. Having gone through the earth, having gone through her filter, and it's, it's an extremely fine particle, very good quality pigment. If you collect iron rust, as an example, from whatever source, you get different types of colors. Um, if it starts out as a yellow umber, you can also bake that and you get burnt umber. You can go out and collect rocks from the roadside and crush them if they're the colors you want and use the very fine particles as a pigment. Or you can go to your indigo vat and collect the bubbles from the top to use as indigo pigment. All of those are the same. And of course, nowadays, there's an incredible range of vibrant colors available at any dye or craft supply store. As I mentioned earlier, soybeans, soy milk, is required to hold the pigment to the fiber since it won't stay in and of itself. And as a matter of fact, that was a huge contribution Okinawa made to mainland Japanese dyeing. This use of soybean as a binder for use in dyeing. If we take a look at where Okinawa is situated, it's sort of equidistance from mainland China and Japan. Both of these nations had their eye on Okinawa, and the kingdom of Okinawa was very keenly aware of that and paid tribute to both to hold them at bay. If we look back to the Ming Dynasty, the 14-1500s, we can see that there was a very healthy trade route established, of which the kingdom of Ryukyu was almost the center, at least certainly a very integral part of it. And in return to sending their tribute out, they also received influences from all over this region. When paying tribute to the Chinese, of course, they geared their textiles to their taste. And when paying tribute to the Japanese, they geared their textiles to their taste. And in the process, they wound up incorporating both of these aesthetics into their own work and having a wonderfully unique product as a result. You'll notice that many Okinawan bingata 
patterns incorporate things such as plum blossoms or pine trees or even cranes that simply don't exist in the islands, as well as, of course, dragons and phoenixes from China. But you can see how these um, became part of the culture in the course of their interaction with these other countries. This is a shot of a Korean temple. Look at how brilliant and bright those colors are. Every single one of those colors is a pigment that is used in Bingata. Okay, so you can see why and how Okinawan dyeing can be so very bright and have this tropical look to it as a result. These are contemporary pieces, very colorful, very whimsical, lots of humor. Um, that is one thing about Okinawan dyeing. There's a lot of humor and dynamic movement in it. Um, these carp are a wonderful example of that. It's a nice combination of bright colored on the left and very quiet on the right. This is a typical example of Okinawan traditional dyeing. The very bright yellow in the background is that fukugi dye I discussed earlier. All of the other colors are things commonly found dyes in Okinawa, and this is an Okinawan shade kimono. Not all of them have to be zonker. This one has a quieter background with the pink, and as a result, calms down the colors around it. However, Okinawans, just like the rest of us, um, have a fascination for things abroad and are influenced. So they're not just influenced by Chinese and Japanese. As our perspective broadens around the world, they have the freedom to pull inspiration from whatever appeals to them. And this artist has done a wonderful job. This particular artist is living in New York. He's an Okinawan. The Okinawans have their own indigenous peoples movement um, since they were appropriated by Japan. Here, he's combining his history and culture to combine in Seoul with the movement and the history of indigenous North Americans. And then, of course, the Okinawans themselves have their own range of myths and traditional patterns and so forth. And being an island nation, uh, the ocean is such a beautiful Beautiful, wonderful part of their culture and embracing, comforting, while at the same time dangerous element of their daily life. Not all colors have to be brilliant. They can be very soft and subtle as you see here or bright and beautiful as you see here. Often there are tints in the background such as the Oboro Bingata sample we started with. This is a very quiet piece where a wash of blue has been put over everything except for a few protected areas to pop out at you. Contemporary Japanese pieces are often influenced by Okinawan design and pattern. This is a perfect example of that. It's not quite as zonker neon color, toned down a little bit more, but by Japanese concepts, very, very bright. This is a piece dyed in Kyoto, not in Okinawa, and you, the long sleeves tell us it was for a young woman. And of course, many of the Okinawan patterns have been uh, adapted to a more Japanese sense of color, where the majority of it is toned down quite a bit. But the popularity of the truly Okinawan, surrealistic, whimsical coloring has never lost its popularity in Japan. So let's take a look at a couple of bolts from my collection. These are things I'll be using for uh, samples as part of my subscriptions in the future. Okay, This first one is uh, dyed entirely with pigment. You can see at the bottom here, wonderful thing about many Japanese textiles is they come with labels. So this one tells us it's tezome bingate, which means hand dyed bingata okay and it's obviously so okay that's a pattern of books of uh, hand bound books with peonies if we go on to the next sample here this one doesn't have quite the movement although it's very common in okinawan bingata textiles to have very very small patterns as well not all of them are huge and dynamic many of them are, t are very small repeats but this one tells us it's Tokyo Zome, okay, Gansai Bingata. So uh, Tokyo Zome obviously means it's from Tokyo. Gansai means pigment, the pigments we were discussing earlier. So this entire piece has been dyed using pigments, although it's not an Okinawan piece. However, it's still considered Bingata in look, if not in reality. Another example here has more of that being got to patterning, um, you know, the whimsy, the surrealistic aspect of it with a little bit of a nod to the bright colors. If we examine the label, it says Ryukyu Bingata Komon, 
Ryukyu means the Ryukyu Islands, Okinawa, of course, Bingata, you know. Komon means small pattern. It's a category of dyeing. Let's look at it closely. Let's see if this is hand dyed or not. If we stop and find the repeat somewhere in here, okay, so we'll keep going until we find the repeat. Okay, there it is. All right, so we match these two flowers together and compare them. I have a couple of peonies here. If we start to examine each section carefully, we'll notice that the peony at the top is absolutely identical to the one at the bottom. The shading is in precisely the same spot. The same with this um, camellia. You'll notice that the petals are, are shaded in exactly the same way, in exactly the same spot. And if you go to any element in the repeat, you'll see that holds true. That means it was printed, not hand dyed. Let's compare that to a hand dyed Okinawan piece. This one is also a repeating pattern. So if we line up our repeats the same way, okay, what you'll see is that even though the artists are going along doing hundreds of these little spots here, they of course they wind up being very similar, but they're never precisely the same. So if we compare the different elements here, we'll see that even though the brown shading is in the same general spot, the actual shading is slightly different in each and every piece. The brush stroke is a little bit different. It hits slightly to the right, slightly to the left. This is not a mechanically or stencil printed design. Okay, the rice paste was put on with the stencil, but the colors were entirely hand brushed. If we move on to another piece now with a very beautiful sense of colors, we'll see that this one too is printed, but this one actually tells you that it is. The label reads Tezashi Cho Komun. Okay, Tezashi means uh, applied with a brush, Cho means as if, like esque, like Ruben esque. So in this case, the label clearly tells us that this is paying homage to hand-dyed work, but it is not in and of itself hand-dyed in that manner. It's a printed piece, very high quality printed, a lot of handwork involved, but not the same techniques as used in Okinawan Bingata. At the bottom, it does say Ryukyu Bingata, which it's not. Um, this was not dyed in Ryukyu, okay? And it also fortunately gives us the name of the artist, which is a wonderful detail to have. You can see very quickly how precisely identical every element is in our repeating pattern. If we take a moment and look at the gold label that's attached, now this is a mouthful, okay? It's the Keizai San Gyodai Jin State Dento Teki Kogei Hin. Okay, and what that means is the trade and industry designated traditional craft. So that means it's government approved. They're telling you this is real. When you're spending many, many thousands of dollars for these bolts, you want to make sure that the quality is up to your standards or for what you're paying if you can't tell that on your own. And then the other little detail it tells us at the bottom is that it's Yuzen Zone and dyed in Kyoto. So going back to actually Okinawan pieces, these horses are just absolutely wonderful. They have that wonderful surrealistic coloring, the wonderful typical shading and sort of seemingly random areas to create movement and humor in the piece. And it's just a, it's a piece I really love. This next piece was dyed in the early 1960s, a typical Bingata piece. You see at the bottom the thatched houses, uh, the banana tree, the little tiny trees on the horizon. So in that up to that point, somewhat realistic in shape. But then suddenly, overhead, you see these dynamic waves surging, just everything in upheaval. You have the boats flung in the air, um, all of the different fishing equipment scattered here and there. You have these birds flying overhead and all these different colors, just incredible movement. And all of this surging down on the tiny town below. And the title of this piece is Typhoon. You get this wonderful range of dynamic energy that comes from total free reign on the proportion of things to each other, the colors and everything else. Just this wonderful crescendo of movement and color and whimsy that is typical of Bingata. In contrast to that, I'd like to move on to a piece that I did when I was very young. This, I, this is a piece I made in the early 1970s as a thank you gift to Mrs. Kanematsu, who had taken me in when I first went to Japan and continued to help me throughout her entire life. We talked about what kind of patterns she'd like, what type of colors, and so I geared all of this to her taste. 
The colors in the background are made with uh, ivy berries, berries that come from an ivy vine that I turned into pigments, as well as other pigments I collected and produced to dye this piece. I sent the bolt to her, which she sewed into a kimono. Uh, this is a picture of Mrs. Kanematsu on the left with her friend Mrs. Sua. Uh, they're wearing a couple of blouses I made for them much later in life. In the end, Mrs. Kanematsu passed away not too very long ago. Her family returned the kimono to me, which was very kind of them. So I have that as a very long-term keepsake of all the kindness that she showed me. Moving on to another piece of mine, in this case, in contrast to the previous one, using very bright dynamic colors, a uh, very lively application. I am, however, layering many, many different stencils, probably about 25 different rice paste stencils were used in this piece, which is not how the Okinawans do it. It's not normally how the Japanese would do it either. But I wanted to create a sense of depth that you find in Western art using the Okinawan aesthetic of color. And um, I hope I achieved my goal here. So I want to thank you all for taking time to visit with me today. It's been fun sharing this information with you. If you're interested in subscribing to any of the textile samples, please check out the links below. If you'd like to find out more of my publications or other types of classes that I offer, then of course, visit my website and that link is below as well. If you'd like to hear about upcoming events, when these uh, new video clips will be posted to YouTube and so forth, be sure to sign up for my newsletter. It goes out about once a month or so and is pretty uh, much to the point and often I'll have other cultural details in it. So again, thank you very much for spending time with me. I'll look forward to seeing you the next go around. Okay, goodbye for now.